Okay, so welcome to Information Theory Lecture 31. It's amazing that we're at 31 lectures already. Um, it's like we just started. Uh, today what we're going to be talking about is we're going to start our discussion of information measures. And as you may have noticed from this particular chart, we've got six lectures left. The hope, the plan, the intention is to spend today and Wednesday on information theory, on information theory, on information measures, and uh, maybe use the rest of these four lectures, <laughs> or five lectures on network information theory. So that's, that's the goal. We'll see how well we succeed in that goal. Um, now, today's material is actually not in our standard book. Uh, it's basically drawn from a number of chapters of Raymond Young's book, um, Information Theory and Network Coding, which actually is a really nice book. And like I said once, at least, we, we used that book, or I used that book to teach from one, at one point. Uh, it's a very nice book. It's a big, it's, it's hard to say which one is better, uh, that one or the Covert Thomas book. But um, the other reason to get this book is, is that not only does it contain some of the material that we have today, but it also it has a fantastic chapter on network information theory, which is going to be the topic of next week. So um, I suggest, uh, if you don't have it, to, to pick up a copy. If, if not for this material, but for the material next week, because we're going to be drawing on that chapter as well. Um, so there's no current outstanding homework, although I did mention that uh, we have um, uh, a couple of augmentations to the assignments, because you're going to be reviewing, you're going to be writing, writing summaries of these papers. and every So next week, you're each going to be assigned like four or five papers, kind of like a conference review, and your job is to review them. And then the primary author of the paper is going to be the arbiter or the, of, the, of, the, of the quality of, of the judgment quality of those, of those reviews. Um, so this is uh, very outdated, and I really should delete this at this point. Um, so um, OK, so this is old stuff. Uh, this is more on the final presentation. We do have a deadline tonight, which I want to remind everybody. So what should be what what you should have tonight is uh, basically an up, up, updated list of proposed uh, papers based on any feedback. I mean I think most of the papers were pretty you know, remarkably good actually, and I think that um, most of my feedback were along the lines of make sure you work hard because these are going to be challenging papers to read. But what I want to remind everybody to do again is to make sure that you upload. PDFs of the papers, even if you've done it before. So even if you did it last time, please do it again. Okay. You should have gotten a reminder. OK, so uh, there's no review today because we're starting a pretty new topic. And I thought that rather than going back and reviewing properties of the Limple ziv coding, which doesn't really set you up for today's material, we'll just start from the beginning. Which I guess you know does have a review section because we're reviewing uh, some of the properties of just the very simple information qualities that we saw very early on back last quarter, um, and so we remember that we saw these Venn diagrams. Are you sure? Uh, this is, so this is sort of a way we can use these Venn diagrams, and we saw that that they're a useful way of remembering the relationships between these entropic quantities. And you know, you just write one of these things. And you remember that, oh, OK, well, the blue oval is the entropy of, um, the entropy of, y of x, this guy. And this other oval is the entropy of y. And the, and the intersection between the two is the mutual information. The union of the two is the entropy of the, of the two random variables. And the idea is that this stuff in the middle, you know, the mutual information, is the information that's common amongst x and y. Um, and then we can get nice relationships by, for example, saying things like, very easily, we can get that h of x given y plus the mutual information between x and y is equal to the entropy of x, just from reading this off the diagram. And so what we're going to do today, in some sense, is formalize at least to the extent possible, which was the original goal of this material, was try to come up with a sort of a more formal set theoretic way of describing the properties of sets and set theory and, and measures and information, and seeing whether or not it's possible to deduce new inequalities about, mutual, about the, the Shannon 
Shannon quantities in, in multiple dimensions, namely, or multiple random variables. So, you know, we're not really necessarily going to, this is really important. So, we've never said what's in these sets before. Right? These are just sets. And um, we've said that what is in the sets is, is sort of information, sort of like it measures the amount of information. And if there's an overlap between two sets, then there's some sort of common information. Common information in the sense that if you know one, then you get some reduction in coding length requirements, or you know you can actually reduce the coding length requirements if you condition on one. Conditional entropy is lower than entropy. Um, so we're going to use formal set theory to describe the relationship between these, but we're still really not going to characterize this. This just to make sure that you don't be um, expecting something which isn't going to happen. We're not really going to define very carefully what's in the sets. It's still going to be this relatively amorphous quantity called information. Instead, what all we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, there, there's either an intersection or there's not an intersection, and there's going to be some measure. There's going to be some way of measuring the size of a given intersection or a given set or a given subset or, different, or you know, something like that. Some set theoretic quant operation on a bunch of sets, we're going to be able to measure that. But we're not going to really say what any given element of that set is. We're not going to say if it's countable, if it's uncountable. We're not going to do anything like that. Okay. Now, why do we do this? Well, it's going to help us gain intuition. It's going to help us prove theorems. And it also will help us to understand and maybe deduce sort of new, maybe non-Shannon information quantities. Now, by non-Shannon, we say not previously known, but, you know, previously as, you know, previously from the perspective of 1948, <laughs> you know, and these are things that were sort of some of the quantities that we're going to encounter were somewhat informally derived in like the 90s, but what this material does is, is maybe somewhat more formally quantify them. Okay, so let's do a couple of definitions. Um, we're going to assume that we've got a set of n random variables. Okay. So um, now the set of random variables is very different than the sets we're going to be used that we're going to be using to describe the information of these random variables. And to do that, what we're going to do is for each random variable, we're going to associate a set a set variable. So we have random variable x1 and its corresponding set variable, which is x tilde 1. Okay. All, all we're saying is right now that there's an association between them. Now, we're going to generate fields, which we're going to de uh, denote by fn. And a field from these sets can be generated by taking these sets here and taking things like unions or intersections or complementations of set differences and so on of various combinations or subsets of this sort of underlying ground set of, of random variables, ground set of sets. And then atoms of a field will, you know, by definition, be generated in the following form. So any given atom, which is in some sense a fundamental unit of what we can measure. And so why, why do we call it an atom? Because we're sort of saying these are atomic. We can't, from the perspective of what we can see, which is all based on these sets, we can't break apart an atom any further. So an atom is fundamental. And the way that that's going to be done is by taking the intersection of, um, some people in logic would call them literals, y sub i. Uh, so basically it's the intersection of n y sub i's, where y sub i is either one of either this set or its, its complement. Right, so in logic you have a Boolean variable and you can take a, it's, it's, you can take a, have an expression involving the variable or its, or its negation, which are called literals. These are like in some sense literals sets and we're taking the intersection of a bunch of literals. And so here's an, an example. Let's say for example that um, n is equal to 2. Let's see if we can zoom in on this a little bit. One of these beautifully done hand-drawn figures. So if n is equal to 2, we have two sets, x1 and x2. Right? 
So if we take the intersection of x1 and x2, we get this. If we take the intersection of x1 and x2 complement, we get this. And notice that uh, this green atom and this yellow atom do not intersect. Right? Why? Because they're formed from uh, two sides of, of, a, of one of the sets, x2 or x2 complement. Similarly, we can take x1 complement intersect x2, or we can take x2 complement, x1 complement, x2 complement. And then if we have uh, three sets, uh, it's the same kind of deal, right? Except that now, rather than having only four sets, we have um, eight of them. Right? So we have, here we've got um, x1, x1 complement, x2, x2 complement, and x3, x3 complement. And we have eight atoms. Okay. Everybody clear on that? Notice also that there's no intersection. Every atom, the intersection between any two distinct atoms is the empty set. And why is that? Because every two distinct atoms has at least one um, change in complement relationship, one variable who's the complement. So that basically partitions, it's a partition of the space. So in general, uh, we have uh, 2 to the n atoms. So we're going to use this notation A, script A is the set of atoms. And how many do we have? Well, we have 2 to the n, right? Why? Because there's n random variables, and each random variable can be either itself or its complement. So we can describe it with a bit vector. The atoms are disjoint. Well, we've already said why they're disjoint. There's at least one factor which uh, is complement of another atom. And moreover, there's two to the two to the n elements of the field. So a field is a union of a set of atoms, right? So any element in the field, anything that's in some sense measurable, is going to be some set of atoms. And there's two to the n atoms. And so any element in the field has a bit vector associated with every one of the atoms, the two to the n atoms. And so there's two to the two to the n elements of the field. Yeah. Is the field always the union of all atoms, or can you find fields that are like a union of a subset? Of um, you could define fields that way, but in this particular case, we're defining the field as the union of all possible subsets of the sets of that set of atoms. So there's two to the two to the end of them. So, and, and they're disjoint. So there's, they're distinct entries. Right? The reason why there are that many of them is that you can't have, you know, each atom is disjoint, so every time you add a new atom, you've got a new field element. So like I said before, you know, the sets, we're not really going to define in, in these sets, in these Venn diagrams, we're not really going to be talking about elements of those sets. And, and so as a result, we don't need to worry about the sizes of them. We don't need to worry about if they're countable or not, um, or if they're finite even. Um, but what we will be doing is measuring them with the signed measure. So what a, what a measure does is basically says for any atom, or more more really for any for any field element, it essentially gives a, a value, and it's going to be a sign measure, which basically means that it's not necessarily going to be positive. So a lot of measure theory involves you know non-negative measures. Here we're going to allow the measure to be signed. Um, so it's real valued, and it's defined on the elements of the field. But the critical thing is that it has to be additive. It's an additive measure still. So what that means, what does additivity mean? Um, it means that if you have any two distinct elements, or two, two disjoint elements, A and B, that when you measure the union of these two, dis two disjoint elements, that's equal to the, the measure of one plus the measure of the other. That's the additivity property. Uh, as opposed to, say, something like subadditivity, which would, subadditivity would um, turn this into an inequality. But, but we're not so bad. Super additivity would turn that to, into the other direction of inequality. This is additive. So one thing to note is that right away we have uh, a constraint on what a signed measure must be because the empty set um, must be have measure zero. And the reason for that is is because when we union together, because of the additivity property. 
when we're union together the empty set with any set A, that gives you back the set A inside of the measure, but outside of the measure, it gives us the measure of A plus the measure of the empty set, which must be the same value, so therefore it has to be equal to zero. The measure of the empty set has to be equal to zero. Um, Um, and, and the empty set I should mention is a member of the field, right? Because it's, it's the union of no atoms. Um, now the other thing to, to remember, in case this isn't clear, is the notion of set difference. So this this notation is commonly used backslash, um, and sometimes you see people use minus the white a minus b. Uh, I personally prefer backslash since it takes less horizontal space but there's no other particularly nice reason. Um, but what it really means is basically taking the intersection of A and B's complement. So that's, that's just the def definition of, the, of, that, of set minus. So it's removing anything from A that's also in B. B could have more stuff. This, they could be disjoint, and it would, it would return A. B could be a superset of A, and we get the empty set. Or B could have some intersection, and all the stuff that's in B not in A, it, it doesn't do anything. So in other words, what this means, if this isn't clear, is A backslash B is equal to A backslash A intersect B. The most we can remove is what is in the intersection. So again, thanks to additivity, of the measure, any sign measure on any of the elements in the field is defined by its, its value on the atoms. In fact, what we're doing is we're summing up the values on the atoms. So we can take any, any guy here, x, can be represented this way as the union of, of these literals, which are the appropriate cho the chosen atoms. Actually, no, it's the union of atoms, not the, and the atoms are the intersection of literals. But, um, then what we can do is when we measure x, um, I should uh, I should have this, have, have this written. If we measure x tilde, that's just going to be equal to the sum over i of the measure of y of i. Again, that holds from um, additivity. So here's an example uh, with two sets, and this looks very similar to the Venn diagram that we just saw with respect to uh, the entropy quantities. And that's not a, not a coincidence. Um, so we can then define a sign measure on um, the field, um, that there, and it can, it's essentially determined by the four the values on the atoms, and it's because of the additivity property, because any member of the field is a is a union of atoms, and because any measure on any member of the field is the sum of the measures on the union of atoms, then in this particular case, the, the, the value of any member of this field is defined by these four values that we assign to these four atoms. Here are the four atoms. There's this one, the intersection of x1, x2, x1 complement intersect x2, x2 intersect x2 complement, and x one complement intersect x2 complement. So once we've got those four values, we've got everything. And thanks to the additivity and the, and the atomic property of the atoms. So for example, let's say that we want to measure x1, x1 tilde. Okay, well x1, that's equal to all of this stuff here. Right? That's equal to um, this stuff, right, pretty, pretty obviously. So it's x1 intersect x2 complement, which is this bit here. And then x1 intersect x2, which is this bit here. But additivity, then we use additivity, and we can say, OK, that's equal to this plus this. So again, x tilde i is associated with random variable xi. 
And so, again, if you want this to sort of correspond to entropy, we would say that this set represents maybe the information or the uncertainty or the compressibility or the limits of compressibility with no distortion or no error uh, associated with the random variable xi. Um, now, from the perspective of wanting to do this using for, for information theoretic quantities, we're going to define the universal set, omega, as the union of all of the um, underlying sets associated with random variables, x1 tilde union x2. So like in this picture, just to make sure this is clear, in this picture here, we sort of implicitly defined this whole box as omega, right? But now what we're saying is actually that's not omega. What, what's really omega is going to be everything in the two circles, in the two circles. So that's omega. And that's what we mean by this thing here. And so that allows us then to define complementations. Complementation is always defined with respect to you know, some underlying being set. So complementation means omega subtract x. So therefore, once we've got omega, sort of the world, defined, it means that it's always the case that one of the atoms is going to have um, empty measure. Right. And why is that? Well, because when we take the intersection of the complements of every, random, of every set, that's going to be the complement of, by, it's called the Morgan's Law, it's the complement of the union, it's complement of, um, there's a typo here, it shouldn't be the empty set. Oh no, this is right, this is right. So it's the, it's the complement of, of, um, of this. My eyes are going bad, I don't see the difference between zeros and sets anymore. Um, so this is just omega complement, right, which obviously is equal to zero. Or, is equal to the empty set. Okay, now what we want to do then is start associating these measures, or the values of the measures, with the Shannon quantities that we know and love. Right? So what's interesting, so we're going to do this with two random variables first, but then we're going to find out that we can do this more generally. We're going to start out by, you know, we said we got this measure, mu. And we only need to associate four values, actually three values, right? Because we've got these four atoms, right? one of which, as defined here, has to be assigned value zero because it's an additive measure. So we've got these three atoms that get any value. And we're going to associate them and in some sense instantiate them with entropic quantities and see that as a result we're going to just by using set theoretic notions, be able to derive all of the rest of the Shannon quantities of conditional mutual information, conditional entropy, entropy, and mutual information. So here, here are the associations, these three values. So we're going to say, OK, well, we've got these four atoms, right? This is the one that we said was the empty set, so we just give that guy zero. This one, the intersection of these two sets, we're going to give this guy the value, the mutual information, whatever that is. This one, we're going to give the value conditional entropy. And then this one, we're going to give the value of the other conditional entropy, so h of x2 given x1. Does everybody see what we're doing here? So what we're doing is we're assigning, we're associating, we're defining the measure on the atoms with the mutual with the information theoretic quantities on the right hand side. And now what we want to do is now that we've got these definitions, these sort of fixed definitions on these particular four atoms, we know that we can derive any element of the field from an equation involving the values of these four atoms, the values of the measure on these four atoms. What do we get? What do you think? What do you think we'll get? 
what do you think, what will the resulting measures of these other quantities be? What's your guess? Does anyone have a guess? Well, we're missing, we're missing the entropy of... Yeah, we're missing a bunch of guys. Yeah. But what values will we get if we measure something that... Do you think we'll get back the value of the entropy? That'd be nice. That would be nice. Let's see. What is this called? This technique? This technique? Yeah, or this, does this have a name? Never mind. Um, which I'm not sure precisely which technique technique you mean. Uh, this idea of, of assigning, matching the chain of stuff up with these atoms. I don't know if there's a name. I think I just think of it as associating or instantiating the values of the measure just on the atoms, which, because of the definition, the way we've set up the field, we know is going to give us a value on any member of the field. Right? So once you've got the atom covered. We've got everybody covered because of the additivity of the measure and the property of the atoms. Um, are the atoms and stuff, are those like the fundamentals of measure theory? Or is that how you build up? I wouldn't call them with the fundamentals of measure theory. Measure theory involves you know, Lebesgue integration and lots of other concepts that we're actually not employing right now. Um, we're calling them atoms because they're atomic, because from the perspective of these sets, x1 tilde through xn tilde, there's nothing smaller than an atom that we can ever derive. We could never break an atom in pieces based only on the sets x1 tilde through xn tilde. So this is sort of like a discrete version of you know, something like in measure theory where you have continuous measure on continuous space that's kind of a discrete version? It's related. I mean, so a measure, I mean, in measure theory, a measure is is additive. And there's also non nonlinear measure theory or non-additive measure theory, which involves subadditive measures and other kinds of measures. Um, but uh, for most of sort of standard Lebesgue measure using additive measures. So we're we're borrowing that right from from measure theory, that terminology, because it's a it's almost an identical concept. I mean, the nice thing about Lebesgue integration is that it allows one to unify integration, you know, reminding integration and summation, and see them as really identical. There's not, a, there's not a difference really. Once you do that. But on the other hand, I think that you know, I shouldn't say this on YouTube, but a lot of people who spent many years studying measure theory end up, you know, and, and work hard on it and. They want to prove to the world that they've worked hard on it, so they want to continue to use everything. Everything ends up becoming a Lebesgue, Lebesgue integral. So you never see any summations anymore. Everything's Lebesgue integral with respect to some measure. So it makes for sometimes what are relatively simple concepts expressed slightly more abstrusely, I should say. So, um, but that doesn't mean it's bad, of course. But let's stick with this particular topic, because we don't need any of that right now. Um, so what we want to do is ask this question, is given these, these definitions up here, what would, what would the measure of these guys be, these other quantities, which we haven't defined? Well, let's find out. Well, let's find out what mu of x1 would be. Well, we need to define it in terms of the atoms. So those are the, the atomic decomposition of x1 tilde. And Oh look, so we've got um, the mutual information quantities here, which we're just plugging in from this one and this one. And then when we combine them together, we get our answer, which is just x1. So the, so the measure on x1 tilde is exactly equal to the entropy of x1. So interesting. So the set x1 tilde has now been indirectly given the entropy as its its value only by using measure theory. Now, this you know should hopefully be you know obvious to you because we're we've been doing this since lecture two or lecture one, right? Which is oh look here's this nice Venn diagram and just do this and do that, and, and all we're really doing now is just naming naming you know the members of, of the Venn diagram, or the elements or the atoms. So this shouldn't be too surprising. What do you think the measure of x2 would be? Those of you who are extrapolationists. 
How would you generalize from that sample of size one? That would also be the entropy, of, in this case, x2. Now, what about this one? Maybe a notch above in trickiness. What would the measure of the union of the two sets be? What do you mean by the sum of the entropies? Would it be the sum of the entropies? We're not saying it. We're not saying that it doesn't necessarily. We want the general form. I, I maybe I have a derivation. Let's derive it, okay? Rather than just giving you the answer, let's derive it. So um, the measure of the union is equal to the measure of the union of all atoms in this particular case, right? Because there's um, all atoms cover the union, right? So let's just put, plug these atoms together. So it's the measure of the first atom, which is equal to x1, x2, the mutual information of x1, x2, between x1 and x2, plus the conditional entropy, plus this conditional entropy, plus the last atom, which has measure zero. So if we're summing up all, everything, right? So this looks complicated, right? Is it? Well, let's, we can simplify it by just saying this is just equal to the joint entry between x1 and x2. Right. And this we can get by using our standard conditional entropy conditions. Like we can get, um, we can say, oh, this is equal to the joint minus x2, this is equal to the joint minus x1. And what is this equal to? This is equal to x1, h of x1 plus h of x2 minus the joint. And what we're left with is just the joint, which is this guy down here. So the point is, we've defined mu star only on the atoms. And from this, we've, using the sign measure property and the atomic property and the additive measure property, uh, we've covered all of the rest of the Shannon information quantities on two random variables. Okay. So all, what we've done is we've just formalized this Venn diagram that we've seen since lecture two. Now let's let's go the other other direction. Before we generalize this to more than two random variables, let's say, okay, well, what if on instead of so just to summarize, so what we did is we defined the measure on the atoms, and then we used set theory to see what the measure on all of the other field elements are, and they turned out to be our friendly neighborhood entropic quantities that we've been working with. What if we do the, in some sense, converse, where we define the measure not on the atoms, but instead we define it on the consequence of the things that we just did, namely the entropic quantities that we just recently derived. So now what we're doing is we're going to say, okay, we've got four quantities. The measure on the empty set is zero. The measure on x1 is just the entropy. The measure of x2 it's just the entropy of x2, and the measure of the union is going to be the joint entropy. Now, those are the only values of the measure that we've defined. Now, do you think that we can then take these, defin these associations and then construct values for any atom? Yes. Yes. Why do you think that? Seems like there's plenty of equations we can write to uh, solve for whatever you're looking for. Yeah. It should be the case that there's maybe like four equations and four unknowns or something. Um, so let's see. But the question is, what do we get back? Are we going to get back the same def the same quantities that we originally defined uh, on the atoms, the natural ones? So that basically means that you can get unique values, but are they the same ones? Are they the right ones? It always confused me from last semester how the mutual information of three things could be negative. Well, we're going to talk about that today. We're going to we're going to um, that's this is finally going to explain. I think last quarter I mentioned that we'll ultimately do this information measurement, and so now we're finally doing it. We're going to revisit that quantity and talk about it in some depth today, hopefully. Um, so then, from set theory, you know, 
just by defining the measure on these four entities, we can actually get the rest of the values for these other quantities, for the mutual information and for the conditional entropies. So how do we do that? Well, let's do um, the intersection of x1 and x2, which we said, which one is this? The intersection of x1 and x2 is the mutual information. Right? So well, that we know, the intersection is equal to, thanks to additivity, is equal to the measure on x1 plus the measure on x2 minus the measure of the union. Well, we have the measure on x1, we have the measure on x2, and we have the measure of the union. And that's equal to the entropy of x1 plus the entropy of x2 minus the joint entropy. That's equal exactly to the mutual information. So we're just taking the definitions here and deriving these guys. So then, to sort of summarize what we've done in both directions, I should mention here, by the way, that of course we can do the other quantities as well. We can do conditional entropy. We can do the two conditional entropies. So what we've really done is we've recovered Shannon information measures, but rather than using H and I and comma and semicolon and vertical bar, we're using mu star union intersection and backslash. So every time there's a comma, by the way, whenever people first um, encounter information theory to quantities, they always get confused between the commas and the semicolons and the backslashes and the H's and the I's. Here what we're doing is we're saying, well, let's dispense with all of them and just use set theoretic notion. And what we've done here is basically said, well, we can just use set theory notion for everything. And what we want to do ultimately is answer, can we do that for the generalization to n random variables, not just two? So the other thing that may be interesting to note is that from the perspective of the sign measure, there's no distinction between H and I. Right? So we've used H for the entropy and I for the mutual information. But, you know, we could just as well have used H for the mutual information and defined it with a semicolon, right? Right, so H, H of X semicolon Y is equal to the mutual information, is equal to the mutual information between X and Y. And so the distinction between joint entropy and, and uh, mutual information would be made by this one little dot right there. There he is. So actually, if you go back to the 1950s, which I'm sure some of you have done at this point in searching for abstracts, um, sometimes you actually find this notation used for mutual information. It took a while for people to converge, but I mean, the, I mean, this gets very confusing, right? Because if you forget to draw a little dot, or if it gets erased or something, or so they decided, or collectively the community decided, I should say, uh, to change the letter. So we don't do that. But what we want to do is we want to see if it generalizes. So the really critical, you know, maybe theoretical question, which we're not going to we're not going to get into too much of it, but this is the question. If there is an information theoretic identity of some sort, then it would occur if and only if there's a corresponding set theoretic identity. So anything you could do with entropy um, in terms of an identity would be derivable via a set theoretic property, set theoretic quantity. And then, if so, we could actually use set theory for everything. So here's an example of what you might do. So the well-known um, inclusion-exclusion formula. Raise your hand if you've heard of inclusion-exclusion before. Okay, so everyone should be very well aware of that because it's a really, it's a fairly fundamental property in, in combinatorics, in enumerative combinatorics, which is a field of, this is the mathematics of counting, counting things. And, um, this is a very simple example of the inclusion and exclusion formula, which we're going to see much more complicated examples of a little bit later in today's lecture. 
But what this says is that when we measure the union of A and B, that's equal to including the measure of A, including the measure of B, and excluding the measure of the intersection. Inclusion, exclusion. So there's only one level deep of inclusion, exclusion. And the reason why this follows is because when we measure the union, that the union is just equal to the union of A and B that's not in, whatever is in B, not in A. Right? And those are disjoint, and when we measure that, we can separate them this way. Um, and now uh, we have A, we just add um, basically zero to that, where this part is zero. Um, but now we have the measure of B not in A plus the measure of the intersection. So that whole thing is just going to be equal to the measure of B right, from what we said. And so we've got the inclusion exclusion formula for two sets. And then using this uh, association between measures and information theoretic quantities, we see that the definition of the joint entropy can be expressed using inclusion exclusion. We include one entropy, we include the other entropy, and we exclude the mutual information. And, it, and we can moreover solve for the mutual information, and we can say that the mutual information is equal to the inclusion of one entropy, and the inclusion of the other entropy, and exclude the joint entropy. So just swapping two terms around. So what about the general case? So I guess, um, so let's do the general case where there are n random variables, and we have n associated sets, xi tilde. tilde. Um, once, like before, we're defining, in some sense, the universe of everything as the union of all of the sets. And uh, we have one that basically means that one atom, designated A0, uh, is always going to be the empty set. Because it's basically the intersection of the complements of all of the sets. So the non-empty atoms, let's just use, uh, again, we're defining this script A as the notation. Script A is all of the non-empty atoms. So it's basically all atoms except for A0. And those are, those are the ones that are not assuredly empty. I mean, you know, we're not really saying anything about the sets. They, they might be empty, we're, but we're just saying that, we're not saying that all of the atoms are necessarily not empty, but we're saying that A0 is definitely empty, and script A is the set of all not assuredly empty atoms. And so therefore, there are two to the n minus one of them. So the first thing to note is that when we uh, assign a measure for all of the atoms, then that basically defines the measure on all members of the field, even in this n case. Why is that the case? It's the case because every member of the field is the union of some set of atoms. And because the measure is additive, we can always just add up the, if, every, if we have every, any member of the field, we decompose it into its set of atoms and add up the measure on all of its atoms, and we've got the measure of that member of the field. Um, now, we're going to introduce a little bit more notation. So G is a subset of, this, this notation is fairly standard, by the way, where you put square brackets around the N, and that corresponds to the integers from 1 to N. If you're not familiar with that, you are now. And G uh, is a subset of the integers from 1 to N. And then X sub G is just the set of random variables corresponding to those that are indexed by G. And similarly, we have the same kind of thing for um, the set of sets. So we can talk about x tilde sub g, where the subset, where the subscript is the is the set of indices. It's a very useful and now universal notation that people use in probability theory, probability distributions. Okay, now we're going to, so we've got this set A. It's important to, to, to make a distinction between A, which is all atoms that have the possibility of having a non-zero measure. Um, and then B is just going to be basically um, the union of all 
well, the union of set of all, it's the set of all possible unions of sets. Okay, so the B is the, essentially the set of subsets of the set of subsets. That does not make sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah I, I don't know if it makes sense either. Sometimes you say these things and they make sense at the time you're saying it and if you're trying to reconstruct it. But basically what it's what we mean is that so so we have all the integers from one to n, right? G is the set of all subsets of integers from one to n, right? And x tilde sub g is the set, it's, the, it's like the union of sets, right, corresponding to all subsets of the set of integers from one to n. And so b is essentially that set of subsets of the set of subsets. Is it the power set? Um, well, it's not really the power set because we're not saying necessarily that the x tilde g's don't intersect, right? Because the, the x g's are not atoms, right? Um, it's just basically these are. I mean, these are. I mean, so x tilde are are the sets corresponding to our random variables, and this is all possible unions of any subset of the set of sets corresponding to our set of random variables. That actually did make sense. So go back. Somebody go back and listen to the YouTube lecture and tell me if that first instance of that crazy sentence made any sense. Maybe I should do that and delete it if it didn't. So it would be like on a Venn diagram, any, any way to color in. It's um, a very good idea. How about we do a Venn diagram? I'll do a landscaped timetable. There we go. Let's use this template. Okay, so if we have two sets, if we have this, if these are the three sets, we have three sets. So this becomes x1 tilde, x2 tilde, x3 tilde. It's going to be either this, <laughs> it's going to be either x1, x2, or x3. This, or this, or this, x1, or x2, or it could be this, or this, or this, or this. I think that's all of them. Any set of size one, any set of size two, any set of size three. But they, they could have some intersection. This is why I don't write on a whiteboard. No, actually, I can write much neater. But does this make sense? Yeah. To people? Okay. But in this particular case, it's for all. It's for n, right? So it's not just three. And in that case, n was three. This is for any general n. Okay, so this is the theorem we want to prove. Um, and, and we're going to spend the rest of today's lecture probably on this theorem. Maybe a little less. But basically, the sign measure mu on, on this field is fully specified. We know that the sign measure is fully specified by the measure on the atoms. What this is saying is that the sign measure is fully specified by the measure on the members of B, script B. So we just need to define the measure of B. So remember, this corresponds, like, these sets corresponds to the entropy. So if we have the definition, if we just have, if we define the measure by the entropies on the sets and the and the joint entropies, then we'll get everything else. That's kind of what we're saying here. So that everything is defined based on the entropies of the random variables. But this is more general because this is with respect to a sign measure. Yes, that's what we're going to prove it with. Yeah, exactly. That's right. We're even going to prove inclusion and exclusion in general. So we're going to do that. Um, but it's a very simple proof, it turns out. I mean, it's, it's a lot easier than you, you might have imagined. So, so we're defining, so basically, just like I said before, so before we've defined mu on the atoms, <clears throat> and we said it defines mu everywhere else, here what we're doing is we're defining mu on the elements of script B. And we're saying that also defines mu everywhere else other than the elements, including the elements of script B. And so what this does is it allows us to generate all of the information quantities. And even all, all of the Shannon ones, and even some of the sort of non-Shannon ones, like this one with the three semicolons. But instead of three semicolons, we'll have n minus one semicolons. Okay, so here's the inclusion-exclusion principle. So this is now what we're going to do with a very simple sign measure, which is called the cardinality measure, the counting measure. But the same idea will work for any measure. 
the same proof idea will work. So first we're going to use the property of the binomial expansion for, of zero. Okay, so what is, how do we write zero? Well, zero is equal to um, one minus one, right? That's an easy one, and that's equal to one minus one to the nth power. But now let's expand this using the binomial expansion of one minus one to the nth power, and we get this very, very complicated looking expression for zero. Right? It's basically the sum for L is equal to zero to N of N choose L times negative one to the L times one to the minus one. And this works for any A, B, including one minus one, which just so happens to be zero. And here's a, here's a way of writing it. It's one minus N choose one plus N choose two minus N choose three and so on and so forth up to, depending on what N is, it's negative one to the N, which is either one or zero to the N choose N. Sorry, it's either one or negative, it's either one, not one or zero, it's either one or negative one times N choose N. Okay, so we're going to do this in general for set A, and I, I realize now in doing this that this is a notational, notational misfortune, that we, we don't mean these A's necessarily to be atoms, these are just any arbitrary set A, but we're going to define the inclusion and exclusion on these sets A. Um, I should have used a different notation here. But here's the form of the inclusion exclusion principle, one of, one of the forms. So basically we have this set of sets, AI for I's equal to 1 to n. And each of AI is a subset of some underlying you know, omega. And what we want to very easily show is this form of the inclusion-exclusion, which basically says that if we want to measure the size, or if we want to count the number of elements in the intersection of all of the sets, um, we first sum up the independent measures. Now, just intuitively, that alone, that green part, should be a massive overcounting, right? Because any any intersect. First of all, this is we, we, on the left hand side. We want this. So, we want the measure of the intersection. On the right hand side, it's like a measure of the union, ignoring any any overlap completely. Right? So, um, so that's going to be a huge overbound, massive overcounting. So therefore, we need to remove some stuff. We want, so we've included a, a bunch of stuff, but now we want to exclude a bunch of stuff. And so what we're going to exclude is this. Okay. But now that's going to end up being an undercounting. We're going to be too small. So now we're going to overcount again. And we keep doing this, overcounting, undercounting, overcounting, undercounting. We keep sort of wiggling back. This is the value we want. We're going to overcount and undercount and overcount and undercount. And at some point, when we add up all of them, we're going to get the same value, inclusion, exclusion. And that's what happens when we get to the very last term. The last term fixes things, ultimately. And uh, people have probably heard of the sieve of Eratosthenes who came up with this uh, a long time ago. It was very clever for someone a long time ago. If someone said this today, it would still be somewhat clever, but not quite as clever as when Eratosthenes said, said this. But it's basically a measure for, com for computing the set of primes up to a given set of n, where basically you, you keep filtering things out. You keep, it's the method of sieves. And inclusion and exclusion is one of the methods of sieves. You're sort of filtering stuff out, or you're adding and then removing and filtering and adding and filtering. So it's like a sieve method. And like I said, this is a very important general strategy and property of, 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 of a class of methods that people use in the field called enumerative combinatorics, which is a really amazing branch of mathematics on counting. Counting is not so easy. Counting is, there's all kinds of counting problems that are kind of interesting. Um, so how do we prove inclusion and exclusion simply for the purposes of this class? So let's start out by um, considering an x in omega. And let's just assume that x is in all of, all of the elements, all of the a's. Right? So that basically means that the left-hand side of this equation, if x is in all of the a's, then what is the left-hand side? What is this bit measure for that one particular x? So if, if one x is in all of the a's, What's the contribution of that x to the left-hand side? Yeah. It's the intersection of all sets. So that 
So that one, it's just one. Right? It's just one. Right? So like it, as soon as x is not in one of the a's, if x is in only n minus one of the a's or n minus two, as soon as x is not in one of them, we take the intersection of all of them, and that x contributes zero. Because right? we're taking the intersection of all the sets. But if that x is in all of them, then the contribution for that x is just going to be one. And in fact, the only contributions to this left-hand side are going to be by those x's that are in all of them. And so what we could do to get the answer to the left-hand side is to sum over all of the elements that are in all of them. Right? Now the question is, if to way of, way, one way of proving this is to say, okay, well, is the, let's, does, for, that, for that one x, what is the right-hand side? And if that's equal to 1, then we've proven at least that the contributing factors of the left-hand side of the equality and the right-hand side of the equality are the same. The next thing we would need to do is say, suppose that there's some x that, that is missing some of the x's, some of the a's. And we, if the left-hand side is clearly 0, we need to then evaluate the right-hand side and show that that's 0. So let's do the first case. So the left-hand side of this equation contributes only 1 of this x. And for the right-hand side of that equation, of the inclusion inclusion, we want to look at what contribution for this particular x will be. So we want to make sure that that's, that's 1. So, um, so remember, we're pretending that another way you can do this is, for example, remember the, these are additive measures right, on the, on the right-hand side, or not all of them. right? So if x is in all of the a's, then how, how, what's the contribution of this bit right here? Oops, this part. What's the contribution of that? N. This is going to be n, exactly. And what's the contribution of this? N choose 2. And what's the contribution of this? N choose 3. And so on and so forth. So let's just use this property. So we've got here, we've got n, we've got to worry about the signs. We have n minus n choose 2 plus n choose 3 minus n choose 4 and so on and so forth all the way up to negative 1 to the n minus 1 times n choose n. And um, we can write n as negative 1 to the 0 times n choose 1. Right? So that's just 1 times n choose 1. That sort of unifies the notation. And then we can take out a factor of negative 1. And we've got negative 1 times, if you can see all this stuff. Um, negative 1 times everything after we've removed a factor of negative 1 from everything. Right? Because we're taking out this factor of negative 1. And so, for example, like this guy, oops, I want to use the pen here. This guy, negative 1 to the 0, it becomes negative 1 to the 1. Because negative 1 to the 1 times negative 1 to the 1 is the same as negative 1 to the 0. Because it just flips. It goes from negative 1 to, pl to plus 1, and negative 1 to plus 1, depending on what the power is. It depends on if it's even, it's, it's 1. If it's odd, it's negative 1. And so we've basically incremented the power of negative 1 for all of the remaining factors. And the next thing we're going to do is add 0 on the right-hand side. So the equation is exactly the same except for adding 0. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take this 1 and express him at the very beginning. We're going to move that 1 from that 0, express it at the very beginning, and write that 1 here. The rest of this stuff is the same. And this negative 1 here, this negative 1 here, is the same as this negative 1 there. But now, when we look at all the stuff I'm about to highlight in yellow, that's basically the binary, that's the binomial expansion of zero. Yeah, 1 minus 1 to the n. So we get negative 1 to 
the 1 minus 1 to the n minus 1, which basically means it's equal to 1. So the contribution of any x on the left-hand side is 1. The contribution of any x on the right-hand side is 1. Therefore, when we sum up all of the elements that are in all of the a's, the contribution on the left is balanced by the contributions of those guys on the right. Hence, it works. Now, the other thing um, we have to do is if you suppose that x is an a um, for only uh, k of them. So right, as soon as, as soon as we're missing 1, as soon as we're out of 1a, we know that the contribution on the left has to be 0. Let's assume that it's in k, where k is strictly less than m. And here's the formula. M, um, again. So the left-hand side clearly contributes 0 for this x. And what we want to do is show what the right-hand side contributes. And what we can do is basically <laughs> You do exactly the same thing. I'm not going to go through this, uh, but here are the equations that you can peruse at your pleasure. Uh, but to be honest, it's very simple. I mean, it's just a very simple proof of inclusion exclusion principle, where we say, okay, well, we just we look at this and we look at each one of the terms. And we say, okay, well, how many there's going to be? If it occurs in k of them, this is going to be k, right? Um, and if it occurs a k of them, we're going to have here, like, let's just do this one. So, the, so how many terms is, is that entry going to contribute to that guy there? It's a little tricky, but it's, it's not actually that tricky. It's going to be n choose 2 of them. That's all of them, right? Minus n minus k choose 2. Because um, for n minus, so, so n minus k of the elements do not have it in there. And so the number of ways of choosing 2 from n minus k corresponds to the, the, the amount by, by which we subtract, the, the amount that we subtract from all of them, all n choose 2 of them. So the contribution of this guy is going to be n choose 2 minus n minus k choose 2. The contribution of this guy here is going to be n choose 3 minus n minus k choose 3. Right, because those are, the main, those are the ways of choosing from amongst the ones that do not contain the element x. Sets of three, sets of size three. So this is n choose three minus n minus k choose three. So sometimes it's easier to remove what you're not counting than to add what you are counting. Right, so this is removing what we're not counting. But that's, um, and these are like these are the kinds of things you do. These are these are very basic enumerative combinatorial properties and ideas. And so you get this mess. Um, here's the thing that we were just talking about. Where does that live? Just so that you know that I'm not deceiving you. Why would I deceive you? There's n minus two, two minus n minus two, two, two. There's this guy and so on and so forth. But what we end up getting at the end result is zero. So inclusion and exclusion. Now, is there any real difference here? Would there be any difference in the proof? So we, before, what we did is a counting measure. Now we've got mu, which is a signed um, additive measure. So if we choose any particular element, well, on the left, it would have measure mu of that element. right? On the right, we'd have to prove that it is the element mu of that element. But in fact, what we'd end up is exactly the same thing. And the reason why we get exactly the same thing is because of the additivity. All of the stuff that cancels out in the counting measure would still cancel out on the, on the right-hand side measure because of everything breaks apart into its measure on these individual elements, thanks, again, to the additivity of the measure. So the proof of this case is really no different. Um, uh, I should just, for the purposes of um, completeness, uh, there's another form of inclusion-exclusion. So in this first form of inclusion-exclusion, we take the measure of the intersection, which is expressed as the sums and differences of these measures of unions. 
In the second form of inclusion and exclusion, we take the measure of the union and we express, this, we express it as the sums and differences of measures of the intersection. So sometimes that, sometimes the first form is useful, sometimes the second form is useful, sometimes they're both useful, and in the interest of completeness, sometimes neither of them are useful when we're, for example, not talking about anything related to inclusion and exclusion, which we aren't right now. So, we're going to use this form. Um, I guess another uh, sort of way of writing this, maybe this is easier, maybe this is not, but you can express it as a sum of sums, where the outer sum has a weight, which is negative one or plus one, and so these can be useful sometimes to represent what otherwise is a very long and extended formula. So inclusion and exclusion pops up in many branches of mathematics and science and machine learning and information theory and everything. So something everybody should be aware of. Okay, so let's get back to um, the thing we want to prove. So um, remember, we clearly have it such that if the sign measure is defined on k atoms, we can define its value on everywhere else. What we want to show here is that when the sign measure is defined on these unions of these sets, then it can be defined everywhere else. So the first thing to note to prove the theorem is that um, the set of atoms, as well as the set of unions of sets, is of size 2 to the n minus 1 or at least the values that we care about. One atom we know has a measure of zero. One of the unions, the union of nothing, has a measure of size zero. So there's only two to the n minus one, or let's just call it k, of them that we care about. So let's, let's define a vector a uh, as um, a length k vector of the measures of the measure defined on the atoms. And let's also define another vector, b, to be the corresponding vector of the measure defined on all of the unions of the sets. So we have these two vectors. And what we'd like to do is be able to show that one of them defines the other. That's first so We know that the a, you know that, we know that with a, in fact, for any b, we know that we can get this by essentially summing or unioning over the atoms associated with B. We're, we're just sort of using this notation informally, but basically A sub B are the indices of the atoms that um, make up B. So therefore, that basically means that since, since this is a unique decomposition, so any additional any other set of atoms would give us a different B. You know, remember, every atoms are disjoint. So as soon as we change the atom, we're getting a different B. So B has a unique decomposition in terms of the set of atoms. And so that basically means that there's a unique K by K, by K matrix C, such that B is equal to Cn times A. But every element B is basically a weighted combination of the corresponding A's. And that's, like, that corresponds to the row, the corresponding row of C, C sub N. So really the question is, is C invertible? If C is invertible, we're done. And the way we're going to show that C is invertible is use the inclusion-exclusion principle. So the claim, or what we need to show, is that and any atom can be expressed as a linear combination of the measures defined in B. So basically it means that we can write um, A is equal to some matrix times B. So how do we do that? So th it's, a, it's a little interesting and fun. So we're going to use this conditional form of the inclusion-exclusion principle. So there's, there's no difference here. The only thing is that we're sort of uh, A prior A excluding B from anything. It's kind of like take, taking all these sets and just taking this big swath 
called B and just getting rid of it. We still have the inclusion inclusion principle. There's nothing changed. We've just reduced the the omega by B. And so we have exactly the same form. That should be pretty believable. Yes? The other thing to note is that this formula, and in general, the inclusion exclusion principle works for any number of sets, not just n of them. So, like, for example, in the past, we said, okay, we've got n sets, a1 through a n, but, you know, n could be n halves, so or n could be any, set, any number of sets, inclusion exclusion works for. This is a general formula for any n, not necessarily all the sets. So we could actually use this formula on, some, on, a, on any subset of, set of, subset of sets. So with this, uh, we're going to write atoms in this very interesting way. So we've got an atom. Remember we said it's an intersection of set of literals. Okay. This is kind of fun. So here, here are the literals that are not negated or not complemented. And here are the literals that are, are complemented. And so the literals that are complemented, we can say, we can just take the complement of the union. But because we have this property, you know, what is set difference? Set difference is equal to A set, subtract B is equal to A intersect with a complement of B. We can now write any atom as the intersection of the non-complemented variables subtract away the union of the complemented variables, which has this form here. It's the intersection of the non-complemented variables subtracting away B, where B is, by definition, the union of the complemented variables. So any, any atom, therefore, is representable in this form. Okay. So remember, what we want to do is we want to express an atom on the left-hand side as sums and differences of these unions. Now, on the right hand side, we don't have any sum. We don't have yet the sums and differences of the unions. We have these. We have the unions subtract b. That's not yet in. What we want to be able to do is express the right hand side, where each one of these measures is defined only on unions of variables. But the problem is that we've got this b stuff that we're subtracting away. So the question is, if we can rewrite the right hand side without the b, we're we're straight. Right. On the left-hand side, we're straight because we, we said we can write any atom in this form. Right. The right-hand side, we need to somehow rewrite it in a fashion that doesn't involve set subtraction. And that's what we're going to do next. So each of the terms on the right-hand side um, essentially take the following form. So, so we have... Um, you know, it's the union of these things, which is which are things that we like, because that's the union. But we're subtracting away B, where B is basically, um, you know, because it's a measure of some atoms, it's basically it's, it's for the for the atom that we're currently measuring, it's a union over those things for which the atom has designated as as the complement in its intersectional definition. Right. But we can then write this since it's an additive measure. We can write this in this fashion. We can say, oh, well, that's, that's easy to deal with. We just union it back up here and then subtract it back up here and we write the whole thing in this fashion. And the reason why that's valid is, again, the additivity of the measures. You know, any, for any u and v, we can say that the measure of u minus v is equal to the measure of the union minus the measure of v. So now what we've done is we've expressed every term on the right-hand side by a difference between measures of only unions. Now, there's nothing that said that this inverted matrix needs to be positive, right? We can take positive and negative coefficients. But what we have done is now every single one of these terms of the inclusion-exclusion, every one of these, like, you know, one of these guys, We've expressed it as a difference of the measures of unions. And so all of them, it's all sums of differences of measures of the unions. The whole thing can then be combined, we can 
combine like measure terms and you got some coefficient. And it's basically a big sum of measures of the unions. Right. And so what that means is that the measure of any atom is represented as a sum of weighted measures of the unions, the basic elements of B, script B. And so that basically means is we've now defined a matrix, K by K matrix D, such that the atom vector can be expressed as this matrix times the um, union vector. And where before we had this thing, now we've got this thing. And so what must that mean? It's unique. So therefore it must mean that, um, that Dn is Cn's inverse. It's hence proved, as some like to say. So, um, so to summarize, you know, we can define a measure only on B, and it defines the measures for all elements of the of the field. Okay. So, what does that mean? Then? It says, okay, well, are there some interesting things? So, there are you know, the, the, defining the measure just on the unions is basically saying, okay, I'm going to instantiate everything in terms of the of the entropy. The entropy in the discrete case is always positive. Right? The coefficients and the combinations of these entropies, of these measures, need not be positive. So that doesn't necessarily mean that all of the quantities we're going to get are always going to be positive. And um, to give away the punchline a little bit, there's a reason why we called it a signed measure and not a non-negative measure. And so we said that the measure can actually be negative. So, so this is so this is what I'm saying. So we we H of G. This is this is the stuff that we can use. These entropies, these joint entropy quantities, can be used to define everything. That's all that's necessary. So here's here's two simple examples. Let me just make sure there are no questions, or actually ask you if there are any questions. Raise your hand if, if this is obvious to you. Wait, sorry, could you do that again, please? Okay, raise your hand if you have any questions. Raise your hand if you're ready to teach this. I like to do that because nobody ever raises their hand. So if you do, because I'm actually getting pretty tired, I'm going to sit down and finish my coffee and you guys can finish. Um, no, that's not, that's not what one should do. But more seriously, the question is, are there uh, questions? So could you state like, what you just said to make sure I understand it clear? So we have this basic set, and that's composed of all uh, subsets that are made up of all the different combinations of atoms. We're saying if we define measures on the basic sets, then that's just that the bijection from, uh, to the measures about the atoms. Yeah, that's right. So it's, it's, it's like, the unions of the basic sets. The only thing that's different is that it's not just so it's not just the basic sets. So it's not enough to define um, just the measures on x one, x two, x three. You need to do x one, x two, x one, x two, x three, x two, x three. You know, you know, all subsets of indices cor that that correspond to the unions of the basic sets. Okay, so like script B, that's not the basic set. Like Script B is composed of the basic sets, which are. That's right, unions. It's only unions of the basic sets. So all unions, all possible unions of any combination of sets of basic sets. So that's adding an extra layer. It's not adding an extra layer. It just means like if we have basic sets x1, x2, and x3, so we need to define the measure on x1, we need to define the measure on x2, we need to define the measure on x3, we also need to define the measure on x1, comma, x2, or x1 union x2. Also on x2 union x3, also on x1 union x3, and lastly, but not leastly, x1 union x2 union x3. So we need to define the measure on all of those. But that doesn't give us necessarily all of them, because there are other ones like intersections. That only gives us the ones that we drew. Remember that inserted page of that very terribly drawn picture? That gives us only those. Okay, so what can we do with this? So we can, 
I mean, and this is this is the goal. Um, uh, we can sort of express lemmas using set theoretic notions. So, for example, let A, B, and C be sets. So, lemma: the measure of A intersect B minus C is equal to all of the stuff on the right. Now, does this look like a familiar lemma to you? Not quite, but it will very, very shortly. First of all, let's prove it. It's an additive measure. Right? So the proof is based on if we take um, you know, A intersect B except for C. Um, well, that's basically just saying, I mean, we, we know that, um, maybe this will make it sense, we know that A intersect B is equal to A um, union B, well, the size of this is equal to the size of this um, plus this minus A union B. And that's just a very simple form of inclusion and exclusion. And the same is true for the measured case, which is down here. And the same is true if we if we just subtract some bit of C everywhere. Now everybody, we sort of, C is no longer part of the expression, so the only thing that's left is the residual after we've removed C, and so that's still basically, essentially, this same expression here. It should be a plus. But once we have it in this right-hand side form, this form here, then we can say, oh, well, the measure of A except for C is just equal to the measure of A union C minus the measure of C. The measure of B except for C is equal to the measure of B union C minus the measure of C. And the measure of A union B except for C is just equal to the measure of the union minus the measure of C. And then once we do that, we cancel out the like terms, and we get the resulting expression that we want, which is the same thing up here. OK, so you might think, well, what does that do? I don't recognize that at all. But in fact, that's something that we know and love, and we learned in lecture two. Lemma. The mutual information between A and B given C is equal to H of AC plus H of BC minus H of ABC minus H of C. Right? Each one of these are one of these basic sets. Each one of these, each one of these are a basic set. It's just unions, right? It's basically sums and differences of measures of unions of sets. So what we've really just done is proven this, this equality uh, for the conditional mutual information. We can do this in some sense analogously. We can use information theoretic quantities that we know, like you know H. Um, we know that the conditional mutual information is equal to the conditional entropy minus the other conditional entropy. And this is just equal to H of AC minus H of C, which is this bit. And this part here is equal to this bit, and then we cancel like terms and we get the result. But what we've done in the first case is use set theory, set theoretic notions to actually define these quantities. So um, the other important point about this is that you know this these information measures, like once we've defined um, once we've defined uh, this, we've got the Shannon information theoretic quantities for everything, for all remaining ones. So we, we start by defining or associating the measures for only uh, x tilde g for g inside of script b. And we get some new things, like for example, Here's, here's a general uh, instance of that. So if we take um, g, g prime and g double prime as basically sets of indices, and we're interested in what the measure of this bit is here, that's equal to this union. 
where that this is equal to this, which is equal to the this conditional mutual information. But the conditional mutual information actually is, is everything. So depending on what g g prime and g w prime is, we get all sorts of things. Like um, some of the stuff is cut off at the bottom, but we we would get if g double prime this part is not there, we would get just regular mutual information, right? We would get um, conditional entropy if g and g prime are the same, then the mutual information is just equal to the entropy, so we would get the conditional entropy. Again, that happens if g and g prime are the same. Okay. We'd also get just the plain old vanilla entropy if g and g prime are the same and g double prime is empty, and that, then we just get regular entropy. So we get all of the quantities. So this, this notion of conditional mutual information. So in some sense, depending on what the indices of the random variables that we're using within each slot is, in, is a general form. And um, is a general form of um, all of the measures, all of the Shannon measures. I don't know if this is a good time to say this, but basically, you might notice, and for those of you who are interested in submodularity, um, we note that this quantity, this this quantity here, is always going to be greater than or equal to zero, right? And if we just move this bit to the other side, what we're going to get? Let me just erase this to write it more clearly. What we get is that this is just basically saying that um, this is greater than greater than or equal to that. So in other words, this part here is the union of this and this, and this part here is the intersection of this and this. That's the submodular inequality. So basically, the non-negativity of the conditional mutual information is basically just the submodularity of the entropy. So, um, okay. So let's talk a little bit about the signness. So when n is equal to two, we know that there's no combination. We've seen this before. There's no combination of any of the entropies and the mutual information quantities that can be negative. What about when n is equal to 3? So like, for example, what is this quantity? When you take the intersection of these three at, of these three sets, and what might this mean? Well, we can write it in this form, just to get a definition. We can say, okay, well, how do we define this thing? Well, we can sort of unmarginalize it out in some sense and say it's what this quantity here is like one term of the unmarginalized x3 starting from this guy on the right. So we're starting from the right, which is the intersection of x2, and we're measuring, um, I mean, just by using set theoretic notations, we know that we can express it this way on the left-hand side, this bit here. So everybody see that or see why? It's a form of marginalization, the additivity of the measure. And so then when we plug back in our information theory quantities, you know, we know what this is. This is equal to the conditional mutual information here. We know what this is. This is just equal to the mutual information. But we don't really have yet a definition for this. And what we're going to do is we're going to define this in this way with three semicolons. Or sorry, two semicolons. Three random variables, two semicolons. So it's the mutual information amongst x1, x2, and x3 in some form or another. But we also have an expression for it on the right-hand side. It's equal, to the mutual, it's, the, it's equal to the difference between the mutual information and the conditional mutual information. 
But in fact, it's not unique. In fact, we can express this using any of these three quantities. And why is that the case? Yeah, it's symmetric. We can sort of D or unmarginalize out starting from any one of these guys. There's nothing special about X1 and X2. So here's the one that we, we did in the previous page. But we could start instead with X1 and X3, or we could start instead with X2 and X3. In each case, we've got the quantity we want to define here. And we have three different expressions for it. And so this is our notation. So this is therefore, you know, in some sense, a new information theoretic quantity. We didn't, this isn't one that was really mentioned by Shannon. Um, is it necessarily positive? No, we know that. It's not necessarily positive. And I think, I can't remember if we talked about this example last time. But we can actually construct an example for which it's positive and for which it's negative. Here's an example where we have, um, Basically, binary random variables, where x1 and x2 are, are binary and independent, and they both determine x3, which um, is basically just the xor of x1 and x2. And I think we need to leave now. So we'll have to start with this example next time. Unfortunately, this is not a fantastic place to break, but this is our new normal breaking in bad places. Um, well, breaking in class is never easy. I always get nostalgic at the end. But in any event, um, I do recommend everybody reading in, in Jung, and, uh, and you can read ahead in the slides. And also don't forget about your PDF papers. Turn them in with your one-page write-ups this evening. I'll see you uh, on Wednesday. Where's the three-page? Thank you.